I'm going to start the recording over again when I'm uh, while I'm thinking about it. So, any questions about the uh, cryptography, you know, sessions or comments, you know, no issues and things that you're you know having trouble understanding or not sure about. No. Okay, thanks. So, still waiting for a few other people to show up. Right now, it's just the two of you, and uh, you know, it would be nice if we had a few more. I wonder where everybody is today. Emergency meetings, I suppose. Well, maybe I'm going to get started anyway, and we'll just uh, kind of take a slow roll into it. Today, we're going to uh, talk a little bit in depth about cryptography. I've got a, a slide deck here that's on the screen that we're going to be uh, working from in the first part of today's session. And um, I wanted to share this little document too. This is uh, in the uh, file share that's on the learning management system. So you can download it, um, download it from there. And basically, these are online tools for doing some of the exercises that um, are going to be showing up in this. Um, oh, wrong. Sorry. Had it and I left it. Lost it. There we go in this self-guided cryptographic exercise. And we talked about this last week. These exercises are basically for you to sort of like try and play with and kind of understand how some of those different encoding and encryption systems work. And, um, you know, if you happen to be, you know, working from home and you also happen to have school aged children who are also at home. Some of these exercises might be fun to go through together. It's a little bit of a learning experience. I'm just, you know, suggesting might not be like an all bad thing. And, um, but in any event, here we have, you know, a couple different hash generators, uh, Caesar cipher uh, exercise site, ROT13, which is another uh, character substitution uh, encoding system, and then an AES, RSA, and DSA um, sites to, um, to play with as well. So, uh, and uh, that document and this one are on the share. I'm not sure if these slides are, I don't think that they are. Um, but if you want, if you want them, I can uh, email them out to you. So crypto cryptography usage and implementation types is, and the goal of cryptography is to um, meet four fundamental goals, confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. Now this looks like, you know, two thirds of the CIA triad, 
plus a couple other uh, options or a couple other, uh, you know, other goals. And, you know, there is some overlap here, but you need to be comfortable with these four. You know, the CIA is, one, is you know, about one thing. It's about, you know, data security and these, although they really share two, two of the same uh, principles, this is, you know, the four reasons why we have encryption. Um, achieving these goals requires satisfaction of a number of design requirements. Not all crypto systems are intended to achieve all four goals. So some encryption is just about confidentiality and doesn't concern itself with integrity or authentication or non-repudiation and you know others uh, do and so in terms of choosing the best solution for your particular use case knowing you know which crypto systems pr provide which of these end goals will help you you know decide what's the best method to secure your uh, you know to sh secure your information with so let's take a look at these four steps. Confidentiality ensures that data remains private while at rest, such as when stored on a disk or when in transit, such as during transmission between two or more parties. This is the most widely cited goal of crypto systems, the preservation of secrecy for stored information or for communication between individuals and groups. Oh, and we've got a couple more, Parna and Maureen. Let me turn on your microphones. And please, you know, feel free to comment or ask questions as we go through these slides today. Um, but anyway, two main types of crypto systems enforce confidentiality. There are actually three main types, and we'll talk about the third one a little bit later on. But the two main types that enforce confidentiality are the symmetric key crypto systems, which use a shared secret key and the asymmetric crypto systems, which use individual combinations of public and private key pairs for each user of the system. Symmetric key encryption is also called shared key and secret key encryption. And asymmetric crypto systems can also be called public private key cryptography or PKI, which is public key infrastructure. Um, so these terms are synonymous, but these two different types of uh, crypto, you know, cryptographic systems are, are very different and we'll talk about how in a, in a bit. Integrity is our next uh, goal and integrity ensures that the data is not altered without authorization. If integrity mechanisms are in place, the recipient of a message can be certain that the message received is identical to the message that was sent. Similarly, integrity checks can ensure that stored data was not altered between the time it was created and the time it was accessed. Message integrity is enforced through the use of encrypted message digests, also known as digital signatures or hashes that are created upon transmission of the message. Um, hashing is the third type of encryption and hashing does has nothing to do with confidentiality. It's more about integrity and um, authentication and things like that. Uh, hashing is a one-way encryption function. We take our plain text and put it through an algorithm to hash it and it is not reversible. Two popular hashing uh, methods are the message digest five and various versions of secure hashing algorithm or SHA. Um, actually, in point of fact, message digest has been pretty much um, deprecated with the exception of for legacy use. So we're going to be focusing primarily on, on the SHA methodology. Authentication. So we can use encryption to authenticate a user or a system or you know a user to a system so here we have a conversation between a computer and a server and the computer says hi I'm Bob and the server says prove it encrypt Apple and so Bob using the previously agreed upon encryption 
method. You comes up with LPA, which is basically re the reverse, and um, and then that's accepted and they're you know authenticated in this step and authorized in this step. So this is authentication. Um, in most cases, what is being exchanged is a hash of the password. The server will have in a database hashes and usernames of, of all the you know authorized users. When you enter your password into your computer, it's actually hashed and that hash is sent to the resource you are trying to access and so that's the encrypted nugget that approves you for access. But there may be other authentication methods that, that are used as well. Um, but we're talking about those that, you know, use encryption. Uh, Non-repudiation. Non-repudiation provides assurance to the recipient that the message was originated by the sender and not someone masquerading as the sender. It also prevents the sender from claiming they never sent the message in the first place, which is known as repudiation. So non-repudiation is the ability to prove that a certain person did in fact send a certain message. Any questions on these topics before we uh, get deeper into it today? No, nope, no. Nope. So early cryptography, one of the earliest known cipher systems was used by Julius Caesar to communicate with Cicero in Rome while he was conquering Europe. The system was extremely simple to encrypt a message. You simply shift each letter of the alphabet three places to the right. For example, A would become D, B would become E. If you reach the end of the alphabet during this process, you simply wrap around to the beginning so that X becomes A and Y becomes B and so forth. Um, this was, you know, I mean, when we look at it today, this is like painfully easy to um, crack, but back in Caesar's time, not everybody even knew how to read, much less unscramble letters that were in, you know, in a, in a different order. So this was reasonably secure to his purposes. We wouldn't use the Caesar cipher much today, but, you know, there you have it. This is called a, um, a, um, oh. hang on, I'm looking for the word here, transposition cipher or substitution cipher rather. Caesar cipher is a substitution cipher um, because we substitute one character for another. Uh, while we're on this subject, I wanna talk about the difference between encoding which is basically using codes and encryption, which is using algorithms. There's a difference and this is one of them, okay? In a system that uses codes, typically you're substituting one character for another. The original message length, let's say you have a plain text message of 180 characters with a substitution cipher or an encoding system, you're just simply going to replace 180 characters with 180 different characters, and those characters will um, can be deciphered using, you know, whatever the agreed upon method is. But the message length does not change in an encoding system; just simply the characters are changed, and sometimes the characters are switched out. Um, for other letters, sometimes the characters are switched out for other characters entirely. Uh, but in any event, if it's a you know purely substitution cipher and the message length doesn't doesn't change, then it's encoding. Encryption, on the other hand, relies on a mathematical uh, formula called an algorithm. And once a message has been encrypted, the message length may have changed dramatically might be longer, might be shorter. Um, so that's, you know, the technical difference between en encoding and encrypting. Um, the next thing we're going to look at 
and uh, is, is the Enigma machine. Uh, the Enigma was used in World War II by Germany and also Japan. It was invented between World War I and World War II in Poland. And the German high command would, became very interested in this machine. The, mach the Enigma machine replaced something else that we're going to be looking at called the Veneer cipher. Um, and the Veneer cipher was a polyalphabetic cipher that um, basically ran each letter through a different letter of the alphabet based on uh, that position based on the secret key. We'll be looking at that in a little bit, but the Enigma machine basically was a mechanical way to achieve that end. So if we take a look at this diagram, here we have the machine. This particular machine has three letter wheels in here and um, a communications officer would set up the Enigma machine each morning following instructions that were good for that day only in terms of positioning these wheels in here in a certain order. If we follow the path, the logic path from the keyboard, which is the input site to the light board. So we start with our clear text and type the letter T. The letter T in a plug board is lined up with the letter K. And then we go through the wheels. And so the letter K is rotated to the letter O. And then the letter O is rotated to the letter P, letter P to the letter R. And then in the reflector, we bounce back through letter D, letter G, letter R, letter W to G. And so G becomes the output. So this is like basically a polyalphabetic substitution cipher that's been turned into a machine. And so a communications officer would you know, encode the message by noticing the light board and then send Morse code with the encoded message. Anybody who had a um, the day's settings, which were delivered in a one-time pad, which we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, this was literally a pad for with paper for each, you know, with a sheet for each day. You'd set up your machine and then destroy the instructions and, you know, there you had it. So that's how the Enigma machine worked. It was um, because they changed the key every day. It was very difficult, almost impossible to crack. And um, Alan Turing and a group of uh, cryptographers at, and mathematicians at Bletchley Park in England during World War II uh, spent a lot of time and effort trying to decrypt the Enigma and eventually were successful. Um, and um, the reason was that there were a couple of flaws in the Enigma. The, the first one is that, you know, according to the rules, the logic in the Enigma machine, T under no circumstance would ever come back as T. So instead of there being 26 variables, there were only 25, which meant that whatever letter you were looking at in the, in the crypto was, was definitely not going to be itself. And the other problem was that the German penchant for following, uh, shall we say, a rigid format, the uh, German Weather Bureau that reported, you know, made weather reports to the army, started out every communication, you know, the email went out at six in the morning or email, yeah, the communication went out at six in the morning and they started off each message with Heil Hitler. And once they figured out that each message started with Heil Hitler, they were able to know what the characters were for Heil Hitler every morning. They just know it right out, you know, right off the bat basically. And, um, you know, from little acorns, uh, you know, mighty oaks to grow and eventually they successfully decrypted um, the Enigma machine. And uh, at that point they had to take care not to use more of that information than was absolutely necessary um, to prevent the you know, Nazis from basically altering the machine 
in some way. Uh, or during the course of the war, the number of disks went from three to six as the German high command tried to make the machine more secure. So that's the Enigma machine, kind of a fascinating story. If uh, you haven't got it. It was actually also then used in early systems for Unix. Uh-huh. And uh, so that allowed individuals to spy on systems. Really? Yeah. So that you, this, this was all the Enigma, the, the algorithm that was used to derive this, again, was used inside uh, Linux all the way up to uh, the late 60s, early 70s. Wow, cool, I didn't know that. But this is, a, you know, really an interesting story. Um, there was a, a, a movie recently about it and, um, you know, kind of, I've done some some reading on the case and, and they covered the Enigma machine in one of those two uh, cryptography books. I don't remember whether it's crypto or the code book, but, uh, might be the code book, might be both of them covered, you know, the history of the Enigma machine. So um, next thing we're gonna look at is some uh, introductory terms. Encryption is a process by which plain text, which is the, you know, the message we can read in our own native language is converted to cipher text using a key. Decryption is a process by which ciphertext was converted to plain text with the appropriate key. And plain text, also known as clear text, is intelligible data. So basically we have, you know, two kinds of data. We have plain text, which you should be able to read. And then there's ciphertext, which you shouldn't be able to read. And how that all comes together is in fact, you know, what decides how secure a crypto system is. Some of the other terminologies, cryptography is a science relating to encrypting and decrypting information. Cryptanalysis is a science relating to converting ciphertext into plain text without the secret key. So this is what they were trying to do at Bletchley Park. And um, then we have end-to-end -end encryption. This is encryption of data from the source system to the end system. HTTPS, and we're going to also talk about um, link encryption, which basically is the encryption of a dedicated link. Uh, the encryption, you know, typically the difference between end to end encryption is that end to end encryption works on a switched network, similar to the internet um, or our LANs or what have you. Uh, link encryption basically takes a permanent link and it's encrypted. Um, it's encrypted there. Link encryption is more secure because we don't have to include address header information in the packet. The packet is just encrypted. There's nowhere else for it to go. It's a dedicated link. End-to-end um, -end encryption, if you're sending encrypted packets through the internet, you need to have um, address header information that's in the clear and this can provide a little bit of an edge to a crypt analysis, a crypt analyst who is trying to, you know, play with your encrypted packet. Work function. Work function basically is a concept that describes how difficult a computer finds your encryption algorithm. Some encryption algorithms are easy and fast. Some are difficult and slow. And this, the, the amount of work function that's required to uh, use a certain uh, algorithm will be one of the deciding factors in how you deploy your crypto system. Work function is also related to how much effort an attacker would have to go through to brute force your encryption system by trying every possible combination um, of, you know, of keys. So part of the uh, thing, uh, the issue with work function is that we want to spend no more effort to protect an asset than it warrants. 
So we wouldn't necessarily use a very, you know, labor intensive crypto system to protect somebody's encrypted recipes, unless that recipe was like the secret recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken's seasonings or Coca-Cola formulation or something like that. Here we have a slide dealing with the difference between codes and ciphers or what I was calling encoding and encrypting. Um, codes are cryptographic systems of symbols that represent words or phrases are sometimes secret but not necessarily meant to provide confidentiality. Ciphers are always meant to hide the true meaning of a message. So getting into different types of ciphers, a transposition cipher uses an encryption algorithm to rearrange the letters of the plain text message forming a cipher text message. The decryption algorithm reverses the encryption transformation to retrieve the original message. An example we saw earlier was reversing the order of the letters so that Apple became ELPA. That would be a transposition cipher with um, certain, some encryption algorithms use several of these different techniques. Some of them use all of these techniques and it makes it, you know, if you don't know the rules for how the um, plain text was transformed into cipher text, it can be very difficult to um, break these encryption systems. The next one we're gonna talk about is substitution cipher. This will replace one character with another character, leaving the message in the, its original order. Transposition basically takes the characters and rearrange them as, into a different order. This leaves the original characters in the same order, just replaces them with different letters. What's the difference? Well, the net effect is kind of the same, but if you're, if you know, if you're a crypt analyst and you know you're working on a straight up substitution cipher, one of the issues is solved for you and that's what order do the characters need to be in. Substitution ciphers are probably the easiest to break if it's just a pure substitution cipher. Caesar cipher is a good example of a substitution cipher. Um, and the Venier cipher is as well. And we'll take a look at that in another slide. Uh, polyalphabetic substitution ciphers use multiple alphabets in the same message to hinder decryption efforts. So the Enigma was a polyalphabetic cipher. Um, one of the most notable examples of a polyalphabetic substitution cipher is a system called the Venier cipher. The Venier cipher uses a single encryption decryption chart and this is what we're looking at here. Hopefully this is big enough um, for you to see. But basically we have, you know, the letters up here in the top row, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and so forth. And then you'll notice that each substitution each alphabetical substitution is shifted one letter farther over. So we have a, a, a row where A equals A. We have a row where A equals B, a row where A equals C, and so forth. And, you know, we're missing a couple of rows here. We should have all 26, didn't fit on the slide. We don't care. Oh, well, so X, Y, and Z. Actually, here we have them down below here. But in order to use the Venier system, first thing is, is that you need a plain text message. So you write out your plain text message and leave room between the rows of your message for a place to write the key and then a place to write the cipher text. You write out the encryption key and the encryption key can be any length in this case, we have a six letter encryption key secret that is repeated until we get to the end of the message. So if um, I'm, you know, writing a longer message, I'll have, you know, I'll write underneath in the grid, you know, basically in a grid underneath the original plain text letters, 
these letters, okay? So what this key tells me is I'm going to use the rows S, so the row that begins with S, the row that begins with E, the row that begins with C, the row that begins with R, another E row, and then a T. And so it works like this. You convert each letter position from plain text to cipher text by taking a look at, you know, first of all, plain text is A, the key is S. So we're going to take A and take a look at the S row, and that, of course, is the letter S. Then we're going to take the next letter in the in the, you know, this is the message attack at dawn. We're going to take the T and apply the E row, which is going to give us the letter X. The next T uses a different row. It uses the C row. And so that's going to give us a letter V. And so you can see already how basically using a multi a poly alphabetic shift can make this a very, very difficult to crack without having the secret key. And so you just keep going through your message like this. The Venier cipher, um, I want to say was invented in maybe the 1700s, certainly by the 1800s, and was very popular system was used by um, um, embassies and militaries around the world um, through World War One, and was uh, replaced by crypto systems like the Enigma later on, which basically automated or, or mechanized the creation of the ciphertext. Okay, the main difference between this grid and the wheels on a Enigma machine are that the Enigma machine is going to be faster because all the rearranging is happening inside the machine. One-time pad or Vernum ciphers. A one-time pad is an extremely powerful type of substitution cipher. One-time pads use different substitution alphabet for each letter of the plain text message. Um, the Enigma used a one-time pad uh, in order to determine what the day's wheel positions were and, and changes to the plug board too, as far as that goes. Um, and uh, those pads were destroyed um, before they were allowed to fall in the hands of the allies. Occasionally the allies would recover a pad and they would know you know, the position of the rotors for the, you know, foreseeable future. Um, but a, another use for a one-time pad is to agree upon a book to use as a code book and to take a phrase or paragraph or what have you out of the code book and use it for your secret key in, you know, basically a substitution cipher type of a type of a system. The one-time pad uh, is virtually unbreakable if it's properly implemented and um, and the, if you're encoding a longer message, the, the one time, the length of the key needs to be at least as long as the entire message. Reflection. Some of you may be thinking at this point that the Caesar cipher, the Venier cipher, and the one-time pad are similar, and they are. The difference is key length. The Caesar shift uses cipher uses a key length of one, which makes it cryptographically simple to break. And in fact, if you don't know, if you know that this is a shift substitution. Um, you have 26 tries and you should have a answer, you know, long before you get to the last, to the last, you know, alphabet. 
Um, the venue, say, for uses a longer key, usually a word or a sentence. In the case of our example, we had a six letter key. Um, longer keys would be more difficult to do would make it more difficult to decipher. And the one time pad uses a key that's as long as the message is. Any question about these concepts? No. Okay, no. All, all good. Um, many cryptographic vulnerabilities surround the limited length of a cryptographic key. One-time pads avoid these vulnerabilities by using a key that's at least as long as a message. However, one-time pads are awkward to implement because they require the exchange, the physical exchange of pads. So distribution, key distribution is a issue with one-time keys. You know, I need a secure way to get you the pad. And in some cases, this is, you know, a literal pad of sheets of paper with a one with one time keys on them. And we're going to take a look at something in the block cipher. A block cipher operates on chunks or blocks of a message to apply encryption algorithm to an entire message block at the same time. Transpetition ciphers are examples of block ciphers. Um, most modern encryption algorithms implement some type of block cipher. These blocks tend to be sizes like 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, 128 bits. Why? What's special about that numerical progression I just named. Power twos. Pardon? Power of twos. Power of two and what, what does that what does that give me? It's all binary. Right. Yeah, it takes eight binary bits, eights, ones and zeros, in order to create a character using something like ASCII, which is typically what we use in, in you know in computing. So Basically, a block cipher is encoding either letter at a time or in groups of like two or four or eight or maybe 16 letters at a time. Um, crypto systems that use uh, block ciphers, the length of the block cipher and the length of the key determine how cryptographically challenging it is to um, decrypt without the key and determines how secure the message is. But it also, the longer the block and the longer the uh, key, the more um, uh, work effort needs to be used to, you know, to, to use a particular system. Uh, as opposed to block ciphers, we have stream ciphers. Stream ciphers operate at one character or even just one bit of a message at a time. The Caesar cipher is an example of a stream cipher. The one time pad is also a stream cipher because of the algorithm operates on each letter of the plain text message independently. And we have another concept. We looked at uh, transposition and substitution earlier. Transposition, substitution. Now we're getting into confusion and diffusion. So these are two other concepts that you need to be um, comfortable with or understand. A cryptographic algorithms rely on two basic operations to obscure the plain text message, confusion and diffusion. Confusion occurs when the relationship between the plain text and the key is so complicated that an attacker can't merely continue altering the plain text and analyzing the resulting ciphertext to determine the key. Diffusion occurs when a change in the plain text results in multiple changes spread throughout the ciphertext. An algorithm that first performs a complex substitution and then uses transposition to rearrange the characters 
of the substituted cipher text. In this example, substitution introduces confusion and transposition introduces diffusion. Okay, just an important thing to understand about you know how uh, encryption and cryptography systems work. So modern crypto systems use computen computationally complex algorithms and long cryptographic keys to meet the cryptographic goals of confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. There are basically three types of algorithms used today. The symmetric encryption, which uses a secret shared key. Asymmetric encryption, which uses individual public and private key pairs for each end user of the crypto system. And then hashing algor algorithms, which are a one-way form of encryption that's used to authentic to um, um, authenticate or um, provide non-repudiation in, in, in terms of um, you know that the file that you received is an original unaltered file or that the sender is in fact who they claim to be that sort of a thing is usually done with hashing algorithms although not always the uh, digital signatures lots of times are accomplished with public private key pairs too so let's take a look at symmetric key algorithms Symmetric key algorithms rely on a shared secret that is distributed to all members who participate in the communication. This key is used by all parties to both encrypt and decrypt messages, so the sender and receiver both profess a copy of the shared key. Um, if there are more than two people using this crypto system, each member of the, of the, uh, of the group needs to have the same key. So key distribution, just like with one time pad, becomes the primary problem. How do I securely get you the key? How do I revoke your key when you leave the group? How do I change the key when somebody leaves the group and all the, the old key needs to be revoked? This is, these are issues um, with shared key encryption. Um, primarily employed to perform bulk encryption provides only for the security service of confidentiality. It also tends to be computationally lighter or easier, um, which is why its main popularity is that it's, you know, basically quick and lightweight. So we have strengths and weaknesses. The first weakness is key distribution is a major problem. Um, Symmetric key cryptography does not implement non-repudiation, just confidentiality. The algorithm is not scalable, which means that your group of shared, you know, of people with a shared key as it approaches 10, 20, 40, 50, however many people, it, it just becomes, you know, impossible to scale. And especially, you know, if you've got a hundred people sharing a secret key, people coming into the group and leaving the group are going to require that keys be, you know, reshared or changed and reshared or deleted. It's, it's, that's what they're talking about when they're talking about scalability. Um, keys must be regenerated when someone leaves, but the major strength is the speed at which it can operate. Um, it's very fast, sometimes 10,000 times faster than an asymmetrical algorithm. Symmetric key algorithm examples include DES or the data encryption standard, triple DES, which replaced it, the international data encryption algorithm or IDEA, which was used by Phil Zimmerman's pretty good privacy, Blowfish and Two Fish, which were both developed by Bruce Schneier, a well-regarded international cryptographer who is originally from uh, the Minnesota area. Uh, two fish and blowfish are both block ciphers. Skipjack, which is an interesting crypto system that was um, invented by the US government to 
solve the problem that they have of not being able to decrypt communications of criminals and what have you. This is a sort of a the basic idea behind Skipjack is that you would create your encryption algorithm and then send the key to the government who would hold it in escrow in case they needed it to de decrypt something. You know, they, they might be like some sort of criminal activity that they need to know about. Well, this was not very well trusted. Not a lot of people signed up for it. Why would I want to send my, the key to my encryption to the government? I mean, that just seems contrary to it. And I mean, you know, this sort of works under the assumption that the uh, escrow system is going to be impenetrable um, from attack by an outsider and uh, the Office of Personnel Management pretty much proved that you can't rely on the government to keep important information secret. So it just fails on so many bases. Then we have the Advanced Encryption Standard. In October of 2000, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, announced that the Rheindahl block cipher had been chosen as a replacement for DES. On November 2001, NIST releases a federal information uh, processing standard 19 or you know 197, which mandated the use of AES Rheindahl for encryption of all sensitive but unclassified data by the U.S. government. So AES is kind of like the government approved standard, and consequently, it's used quite frequently in. All, you know, all kinds of places. Uh, AES is the encryption standard now for uh, like WPA3 encryption for most uh, wireless access points, for example. So that's symmetric key. Now we're gonna get into asymmetric key. Asymmetric key algorithms, also known as public key algorithms provide a solution to the weakness of symmetric key encryption. In these systems, each user has two keys and these keys are mathematically linked. There's a public key which is shared with all users. These are public keys are stored in um, publicly accessible databases run by certificate authorities. We'll talk about their role in this whole thing in a bit. But basically, there's a private key which the person who created the public private key pair keeps and should keep secret. Um, and then there's a public key that is publicly available from a, a, a database of you know public keys. If you want to send me an encrypted message, you would look up my public key encrypt your message with that key and send it to me. Anyone who accessed that message besides me would not be able to decrypt it using the public key because the public key can only be used to encrypt information. I would use my private key to decrypt your message and read it. If I wanted to reply to you, I would go and get your public key encrypt my message and send it, send my reply back to you and you would use your private key to decrypt it. Okay, we understand how that works? Yes, yep. So asymmetric key algorithm strengths and weaknesses. Addition of new users require the generation of only one public private key pair. Users can be removed far more easily from asymmetric systems through key revocation, which is to say, when you have somebody leaving your group, you just revoke their key, not everybody else's. That solves that problem. Uh, key regeneration is required only when a user's private key is compromised. Asymmetric key encryption can provide integrity, authentication, and repudiation in addition to confidentiality. Key distribution is a simple process of publicly advertising your key. 
no pre-existing communication link needs to exist. And the major weakness of the public key cryptography is the slow speed of operation. This is basically the amount of work effort required is considerably larger for public key encryption. Some of the asymmetric key algorithm examples include RSA, was invented, developed by Ron Rivest, um, Shamir and Edelman, um, and they created the company RSA. And there you have it, you know, why, where RSA come in. Uh, the cryptographic system called Algamal and electric curve cryptography systems, which uh, basically bases the key on a mathematical for, formula of a pair of ellipses. Um, So taking a look, symmetric key pairs uses a single shared key. Asymmetric uses a reasonably unlimited number of key pair sets. The symmetric keys can only be distributed out of band. I can't email you a symmetric key to be used to send secure email without taking the risk of having that key intercepted on the path. So I'd have to use something out of band, maybe a phone call, um, maybe uh, a bonded messenger, maybe a private security guard. In any event, it's, you know, out of band. As asymmetric, uh, you can ex ex basically exchange the public key in band because it's public. It's publicly, you know, publicly available. Symmetric, uh, Encryption is not scalable. There's a limit to how big your, you know, group can be before it becomes unmanageable. Whereas asymmetric key pairs are scalable. Um, symmetric encryption is fast. Asymmetric encryption is slow. Um, symmetric encryption can do bulk encryption. Asymmetric encryption typically works on small blocks of data and things like digital signatures, digital envelopes, and digital certificates. Symmetric encryption provides confidentiality, but asymmetric provides confidentiality, integrity, authentication, non-repudiation. Um, Before we get into hashing, there's just one other thing that I want to share. Um, I know that there's a, uh, oh, here it is. There's another slide coming up that's going to cover this, but basically, okay, so we have a uh, computationally lightweight symmetric key encryption, and then we have a difficult, but, you know, eliminates the key distribution problem in, in the public key encryption. The way that encryption generally works in most modern crypto systems is that we take our secret key, our shared key, and encrypt it using public key encryption. And I send that to you in order to get around the key distribution problem. I've just sent you the key in an encrypted form that uses public key cryptography and public private key pairs in order to encrypt it. Once you've received and decrypted my shared secret key, we can switch over to symmetric encryption for the remainder of the conversation. And that's how most of this works is that, you know, a, a, a a you know communication session, whether it's with a web ser web server or with another person um, through email or chat or whatever, is going to start with a public key encryption and then switch over to symmetric key encryption as soon as that symmetric key is decoded. So getting into hashing algorithms. Um, Message digests are summaries of a message content and produced by a hashing algorithm. The hashing algorithm has a fixed length output 
with the exception of HMAC here, which of course, you know, there's always an exception. So there are different ways that hashing is used. The most common way is that we have um, passwords that we use to authenticate ourselves to different systems, including systems across the internet, like websites, like a banking website. So I'm going to generate a password and then I'm going to hash that password based on an agreed upon hashing standard of some sort and send you that hash and you will take, compare that hash that I sent you to the hash that was generated when I created the account and is stored on your, um, on your server. And if these hashes match, then the communication session is, is ensured. But you can also take a much longer message like a document, hash the entire document, end up with say 128 bit hash of that document. And then I can send you that document, you can hash the document. And if your hash result and my hash result are the same, you can know for a fact that you have an original unaltered copy of the original document. Um, hashing is also used um, to validate that, you know, like a software download has not been altered. You can take the entire code base of a software program, hash it, publish the hash, and anybody who downloads that software and wants to run it can hash it the same way and see that this is in fact an original and unaltered copy of the, uh, of the software I want to use. Um, so that's, you know, different kinds of things that we use hashing algorithms for. And requirements of a hash function allows input of any length. So my ciphertext or my plain text rather can be any number of characters. It's going to provide a fixed length output typically defined in the standard it's easy to compute a hash function for any input. It has to be one way functionality, which means that I can create a hash, but I can't use the, in the algorithm to reverse that hash. And then collision free. In the hashing, a collision is when you have two different types of uh, plain text but it, they both produce the same um, hash output. Um, for a hashing algorithm to really be effective, it needs to be collision free. It needs to provide a unique output, no matter what, you know, for every input, it needs to provide a unique output. Here are some hashing standards right now the SHA-2 and SHA-3 family of hashing algorithms uh, are approved for enterprise usage. SHA-1 has been deprecated and at this point is used as a uh, legacy support. You know, we'd only use SHA-1 on um, software systems that simply couldn't be, um, couldn't be updated. And then message digest in all versions is basically out of use now. So getting into public key infrastructure, um, the major strength of public key encryption is its ability to facilitate communication between parties previously unknown to each other. This is made possible by the public key infrastructure hierarchy of trust relationships. These trusts permit combining asymmetric cryptography with symmetric cryptography along with hashing and digital certificates, giving us hybrid cryptography. 
So a certificate is a digital certificate provides communicating parties with assurance that the people are communicating with are truly who they claim to be. You can get a digital certificate and apply it to a website and convert that website from a HTTP website to a HTTPS website. There are different levels of, uh, shall we say, proof. In the case of the simplest, I believe what I did when I added HTTPS certificate to my website is that I, in order to prove that I was authorized to create an encrypted website, I had to put some code into my homepage that the certificate authority would look for and that would confirm that I was, um, you know, basically had authority to open and modify the web page. Didn't necessarily prove who I was, but it was a reasonable proof. Um, there's like four levels of these certificates. The, the last one requires a submission of a lot of documentation, usually paper documentation through the mail in order to prove your authenticity. But those certificates are, um, shall we say, more trusted than um, the simple type that I, that I applied. For instance, Google still shows my website as being uh, not secure simply because I didn't use a cryptographically difficult enough um, or a, a certificate that provided um, a stronger form of identity. And a lot of times those digital certificates have limited uh, lifespan also. Yep, yep, they, they certainly do. We're going through a recertification process now of some of our servers. So we get them for either a, a two year certificate period. Yep. And we use Komodo. Yeah. That, the name of Komodo is changed now too. Oh, really? Yep. Who are they now? I'll have to go look it up and tell you. I'm yeah, that's okay. I, if you don't have it, that's fine. Um, you know, we can Google and find out. Um, but certificate authorities are companies that provide um, these certificates that become the foundation of the, you know, like a public key infrastructure. Uh, these are neutral organizations that offer notarization services for digital certificates. To obtain a digital certificate, you must prove your identity to the satisfaction of the CA. Um, and um, these are some of the companies that are recognized certificate authorities, but there are hundreds of companies who are. Um, one that's really popular right now is a company called Let's Encrypt because they're providing certificates free of charge. There's, there's no fee for Let's Encrypt. Um, they had a, uh, some concerns. It was, I don't think it was ever definitively proven, but they have like some master keys for their own identity that were compromised or could have been compromised. And so it invalidated an entire group of certificates that had to be basically uh, revoked and replaced. Um, and that wasn't too long ago. And I, I don't know, it was like three, three to five years ago, there was a Dutch uh, certificate authority who was stripped of their uh, powers, basically stripped of their, their powers because they were providing um, certificate authorities to uh, dodgy, crypto uh, criminal groups without requiring the, the, you know, stringent enough identification. So this would allow people to register um, certificates for, you know, like domains that they didn't have authority for. May you start to provide their um, own certificate. So this mm -hmm. just started, but it's for intra internet yeah. um, application. Yeah, and when when you like configure like a Windows server, um, you have to create a certificate for that server to use, and um, you can you know let the software self generate a certificate, or you can go out to a certificate authority and get it. And and um, I will say that um, when I you know when I worked for the managed service provider and did uh, vulnerability assessments, we would find expired uh, self-generated keys on servers all the time. 
and you know, unfortunately, the 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 ease of use of using a self signed, you know, a self signed key, um, also meant it was really easy to to ignore it. You know, it sort of like became set it and forget it. And so, these um, certificates were basically expired, but still being used on 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 the LAN on a, on an internal network. So. So anyway, thank you for bringing that up. Important point. So here we have the uh, certificate, um, you know, the, the certificate process and that starts with enrollment where basically you register for a certificate and depending on what kind of certificate you're getting, you provide them with the um, documentation that they need. They might, you know, want you to take a picture of your driver's license and, you know, forward it um, by email or upload it into the system, or they might want to see a copy of, you know, your birth certificate or something, you know, a, a, a passport, things like that. Um, then we have verification. This is the process where you are, you know, verified for who you are and then you get your certificate and then revocation. Revocation can happen because the certificate was compromised. The end user may have lost or had the private key stolen from them. Um, certificate was erroneously issued. Um, because verification wasn't done correctly. Uh, certificate details may have changed. So some of the details would be like name of the company, address, um, principal contact, that sort of thing. That, those informa that information does change all the time. Or the security association may have changed. And if a certificate is revoked, it's published on a certificate revo revocation list or a CRL. Uh, you can expect to see at least one question with the CRL acronym in it. And this is what they're talking about, certificate revocation list. Applications of cryptography um, on portable devices like laptops, tablets, and phones. Um, it's not unusual to see full disk encryption, which ensures that the uh, if the device is lost or stolen, that the data that's on that device cannot be uh, accessed without the encryption key. So, you know, one of the things you can do with a computer is pull the hard drive, mount it in a hard drive, um, you know, like a USB hard drive device and, and read the contents of that hard drive as if, you know, as if, well, in, in, in English, um, if the drive is encrypted, that's not going to be possible. Then when there's S-MIME for encrypted email, that's another common use of cryptography. And then web applications and websites utilize the public key encryption and certificates to encrypt traffic. Steganography is the art of using cryptographic techniques to embed secret messages within another message. Um, sometimes secret messages are embedded into pictures or videos or even into games. Um, Another form of steganography is digital watermarks. Uh, information is hidden on like, let's say for instance, it's commonly done for, you know, images that are used on the internet and in order to be properly licensed, um, you know, you, in order to use them, you have to have, have paid a licensing fee. Digital watermark allows a, a company that's providing this type of imagery, the ability to scan the internet looking for unpaid for copies of the image. Um, digital rights management is another uh, service that uses encryption to enforce copyright restrictions on digital media. Um, this is used to make sure that you're using a, you know, licensed legal copy of a game or music, movies, videos, and documents. DRM um, can allow a, uh, a company to 
basically limit what markets certain types of, you know, for instance, at like DVD movies, um, a DVD you buy in the United States generally will not play in a European DVD system due to digital rights management. Not sure what they're trying to prevent there, but you know, I know it happens. Um, again, you can use uh, encryption to secure networks. Link encryption protects the entire communication circuit, but this link is generally speaking a dedicated unswitched channel. It's like a you know private line of some sort. Um, end to end protects a path between two parties such as client and server over a switch network. Encryption can be done at lower levels of the OSI. Uh, usually link encryption is at the data link and physical layer, layer. Higher OSI layers such as application layer are usually used with end to end. Um, SSL happened at layer three or the network layer. Uh, TLS or transport layer security um, operates interestingly enough at the layer four or the transport layer. Um, one of the things that makes encryption, you know, tricky is, uh, you know, you might get a question of what layer of the OSI model does this type of encryption use and it might be the application layer, it might be the presentation layer, it could be transport or network or data link. You just have to, you know, kind of read the question and, and figure it out from the you know clues that are in the question. And we have three slides with different types of cryptographic attacks. An analytic attack is an algebraic manipulation that attempts to reduce the complexity of the algorithm. Analytic attacks focus on the logic of the algorithm itself. An implementation attack exploits a weakness in the implementation of a cryptographic system. Um, uh, attacks against an early um, Wi-Fi encryption system called WEP or wireless and uh, wired, I'm sorry, wired equivalent uh, protocol uh, focused on an implementation, implementation um, flaw of using a short uh, initialization vector it was too short and it made it too easy to guess the key of the uh, of the web, you know, the web key. A statistical attack exploits statistical weaknesses in a crypto system such as floating point errors and the inability to produce truly random numbers. And then brute force, basically I just get a big powerful machine or a botnet that's lashed together to provide for parallel processing and I attempt every possible valid combination for a key or a password in order to discover what that password is. So, you know, in the case of passwords, um, I've, you know, I've hacked a web server and I've taken the user and password database, you know, out. And now I'm working on trying to solve for the passwords for these users. And I do that by basically running every possible combination of letters, numbers, symbols, um, and hashing them and then comparing the hash output of my attempt with the hashes that were in the list that I stole. And anytime I get a match, if I go back to my plain text input, I have in fact discovered the password for your account. That's how that works. Uh, frequency analysis is often used. It's, it's especially effective against substitution ciphers. Um, certain letters appear more frequently in a language. In English, for instance, the most frequently letters are the E followed by the T, the O, the A, and the I, and the N. And so I can take a piece of cipher text, count out the number of times that different characters appear 
and the most frequent character appearance, I can just say, well, we'll put E in there. And the second most frequent, we'll put the T in there. And the third most frequent, we'll put the O in there. And with those clues, I may be able to decipher the entire method message without having access to the key, just based on frequency analysis. That's why substitution uh, algorithms have been replaced with you know, substitution that uses also diffusion and confusion and, you know, and transposition and all of, all of that together. Known plain text is uh, a type of attack where an attacker has a copy of the encrypted message and a copy of the plain text message used to generate the cipher text and using the unencrypted and encrypted messages, I try to figure out what the key or the algorithm was for that message, and then I can decrypt other messages. Chosen plain text in a chosen plain text attack, the attacker has the ability to encrypt plain text messages of their choosing and can then analyze the cipher text output of the encrypted encryption algorithm. Man in the middle in a man in the middle attack, a malicious individual sits between two communicating parties and intercepts all communication. So let's say that you are um, going out to your online bank. If I had had the ability to access your computer and to add a false DNS location for your bank, that was a basically at an IP address that was me, I could set up an encrypted communication with you pretending to be your bank and then reach out to your actual bank website and set up a, commu a encrypted communication with them. And then basically you send me encrypted information. I decrypt it and read it, re-encrypt it, send it to the bank back and forth. I basically in the middle can take a look at an unencrypted result of every transaction back and forth in that session. So that's man in the middle. In a replay attack, I'm going to grab some little bit of encrypted business and try to use it for a second session. Typically, these replays will use things like um, cookies you know, take a cookie and use it to authenticate you to a web server. So, you know, authenticate me to a web server that you frequent. Um, another type of a replay attack is a, an exploit called pass the hash. And in this exploit, um, I've stolen a bunch of password hashes. And rather than decrypting them and getting the password, I just simply present the hash itself and get authenticated that way different process, but you know, that's basically like a replay attack. And that's it for this slide deck. Any questions about what we, uh, what we talked about today? So what do you think of Doe? DNS over HTTPS, is that, uh, does that provide additional layer of uh, protection? Yeah, DNS over HTTPS. Um, really actually provides a, an, another layer of privacy. Um, and, um, and it prevents like your internet service provider from knowing um, where, you know, sites you're going to or searches that you may be undertaking um, for certain topics because that, yeah, that DNS connection is, or the DNS query is encrypted and, you know, can't be read by the service provider. Um, but, you know, in terms of like defeating man in the middle, um, making sure that you're using a, uh, a proven source for, you know, a DNS resolver, shall we say, um, that, that prevents man in the middle type of attacks, or can at least. Any Anyone else?
So again, you know, these are the exercises that you can um, pursue on your own. I think I may take a look at a few of these myself. Um, and just, you know, just to play along here. Bob, this is Maureen. Um, am I going to be able to get a copy of these slides? Um, well, these slides are already on the learn on the LMS. Oh, yeah, I meant your and slides you were just the other, presenting. The other, the other slides, yes, you, you can, you know, just send me an email and I'll send you a copy of those. I did. I did. Is it possible just to put your slide decks and these other resources? I know you like to email them out, but can you put them inside of the I can. Learn? I can see if I can get it added. You know, at this point, it's kind of like I'm um, in preparing to do these exercises. In some cases, I found some additional resources that we hadn't originally submitted, and that's, you know, where that's at. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, Maureen, you, you may have asked me for slides like last week. Yeah, and you had yeah. to get permission from the yeah. owner. Yeah, yeah, and those and those slides actually were used to develop the online content, and and for that, no, I can't, I can't provide that. That's already been, you know, and they, and it's just it's sort of like they don't want me sending out the source code. Okay. Orders, if okay. You, you can understand how that is. I could, you know. Yep. I've been doing screenshots. Every yeah, now and okay. then, so. yeah, and you know, and it's kind of like I had to check because, of course, I signed this in, in the contract that I signed with the school district. There was something about not disclosing this content, to, and it belongs to so and so, and blah 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 blah. Now the others, that other slide deck that I had up earlier today, though, though that one, I'm not sure where I got it, but that's mine, and I can, in fact send that around if I want to. I think that's a, uh, from an ISC squared class provided by some other training organization, frankly, but but not entirely sure. But with the time we have left, um, if you want to get into it, um, practice, practice test questions. We want to look at that? Yeah. Okay. So let's get that set up here. Stick with chapter three. No, it's kind of interesting because I'm pulling questions from chapter three. Did this last night for another group, and then we ended up in like domain four questions started appearing, and it's like, huh, well, that's a, that's amusing. Um, but in any event, uh, randomize or by objectives. skip ones we've seen before. All right, so we're going to start off with common criteria evaluation assurance level, the EAL, um, in which common criteria evaluation uh, assurance level are good design practices used, but security is not a high priority. EL one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I will say um, as a way of a hint, it gets stronger as the number gets bigger. How about Miller Road four? Okay. Yeah, EAL2 is even lower. EAL1 basically is your device doesn't meet any standards we can detect and it's, you know, suitable for a grandma, I guess. Although, frankly, with the amount of uh, bad guys going after senior, you know, with scams, it probably is a bad choice for grandma, too. And they don't even have EAL0 on here. Is there a zero? in some of the stuff I have seen. Really? Oh. Yeah. Cool. You know what's hard though is because some of the stuff you find out on the internet is old or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just take a take a look here. Uh CISA. US cert. 
Now well, let's do the wiki. Well, you're killing me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that one doesn't have a zero. Yeah, it doesn't. Let's go back and see what this one. Common criteria, overview, assurance level. That one doesn't have a zero. Yeah. So, okay, my source that I happen to use is wrong. <laughs> well, either that or maybe a little bit out of date, but, you know. Yeah. You know. Which model type focuses on, or types, focuses on controlling information flows that relate to two versions of the same object? Two. State machine model, non-interference model, matrix, multi-level, information flow model, or options D and E, which would be multi-level lattice and information flow. How about D and E? Yeah, just because it's there. Oh, information flow is the answer, which I guess, you know, who information flows, but still, you know, I'm looking at some of these. I was actually kind of thinking machine state model, but yeah, there were two versions of the same object. Information flow model focuses on controlling information flows that relate two versions of the same object. Which of the following is a location on the hard drive? A memory leak, a relative address, virtual memory, or logical address? Say virtual memory? Yeah. That is a good choice. Saw this one last night. Remembered it this morning. Yeah, virtual memory is a location on the hard drive, basically also called a swap file. And it is technically speaking, the first bit of memory that the data resides on, on its way to the processor. So it comes off the hard drive, gets put into the swap file, then is sent across the uh, data bus on the motherboard to the bridge. And from the bridge, it goes to the RAM, typically the random access memory. And from there, it'll, it'll hit the processor cache, starting with like layer three cache, layer two cache, layer one cache, and then processor. And then the data returns to the hard drive, reversing the process. So. Natural access, oh, which CPTED concept attempts to extend the sense of ownership to employees? And um, first thing we need to know is what a CPTED is, which of course you won't have the Google handy in the crime prevention through environmental design is what T CPTED stands for. So, what we're talking about is we're designing a building or a physical structure with an idea of keeping criminal activity to a minimum. We need a concept that extends a sense of ownership to the employees, natural access control, natural surveillance, natural detection, natural territorials reinforcement. I think I had this last time. Hmm. It wasn't natural territorials reinforcement. Okay. That's what I remember. <laughs> uh, let's, let's take a look at access oh. control then. Because I don't think these two are actually well no, natural surveillance. Surveillance. Yep. Natural surveillance. Yep. I'll pick that one. Yep. So are we good with access control? No, I think more said natural surveillance. So we did the second one. Yep. Yeah, okay. Mm. Oh, okay. Natural territorials reinforcement. 
Oh, I swear I got that wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see what this about. Natural territorials reinforcement creates a feeling of community in the area. It attempts, attempts to extend the sense of ownership to employees. Yeah, so I remember there was a question on this same subject that came up in a different class that um, um, where the, you know, designing the space so that people were spread out and, you know, occupied like all different, is that, you know, the presence of other humans is a crime deterrent. Evidently criminals don't like to be seen doing their nefarious deeds. Which of the following symmetric algorithms performs the most rounds of transformation? And rounds, we didn't talk about that, but rounds is basically, you know, the, the plain text is encrypted and then it's encrypted repeatedly a certain number of times. And I will say when we ran across this yesterday, I was surprised at the answer. AES 256, you think, or not, or Skipjack? No, oh, let's try Skipjack. I think you'll like the answer better. Yeah. Unbelievably enough, because you've like given them your secret key to escrow, <laughs> they, they they return, you know, to some semblance of um, difficulty by giving it the most set of rounds, 32 rounds of encryption, but still, you know, the key gets blown, it's not going to help you. I knew AAS was up there for a number of rounds, so. Yeah. Wh which of the following is a prolonged power increase? This is looking back at electricity. Um, we talked about last week. Prolonged power increase, fault, surge, blackout, brownout. Surge? That is correct. And a fault is a short power failure, and these are other types of power, power failure, power, you know, under voltage condition. Your organization has decided to deploy encryption. Management wants to use an encryption algorithm that also supports digital signatures. Which of the following encryption algorithms should you deploy? Tiger Shaw. or Shaw, a pardon? Shaw. Yeah, you know, and it's knapsack. I don't even know what, you know. Um, there's a mathematical problem called the knapsack problem that this is related to indirectly, but um, not even familiar with that one. Which CPTED concept promotes visibility of all areas? The surveillance? Yeah. Natural detection isn't actually one of the three. It's access control, surveillance, and territorials reinforcement are the three concepts. So this is basically saying design, you know, design your space so that you have open, you know, open visual communication, open sight lines, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, what is the final phase of the cryptographic key management life cycle according to NIST special publication 800-57? Operational, destroyed, pre-operational, post-operational. Maybe this price phase? Boy, I guess. Seems like kind of a clunky answer, but it works. Which two processor states are supported by the most processors? The supervisor state and the problem state, the supervisor state and the kernel state, problem state and the user state, 
supervisor state and elevated state. The supervisor and colonel. I think the first one. Yeah. The first one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's go with that one because that is yep. the correct answer. Now, the processor, the supervisor state is also called kernel mode. So that would eliminate this because it's a duplication of terms. The problem state is also known as user mode. So that would eliminate this one because it's duplication of terms and supervisor state and elevated state again is sort of a duplication of the concept. Which form of cloud computing has as its main security focus VPNs? Uh, Net, network as a service. Yeah, I got to thank you right there. Yep. Main focus of network as a service is cloud computing deployment is VPNs. I wish every question could be that easy. Yeah, yeah. And every now and again, you know, you'll get one um, that just is like, oh, that's so obvious. Take it and run with the free gift. Don't overthink it. Don't overanalyze it. Don't try to decide if they're trying to be tricky. Just, you know, go. Which of the following encryption algorithms supports digital signatures and encryption? RC6, ECC, Diffie-Hellman, or DES? Let's see. Try RC6. RC6. Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, ECC, elliptical curve. Um, encryption. I was thinking Diffie Hellman, but it shows you, you know. In providing non repudiation by using digital signatures, who cannot deny the authenticity of communications? The sender. You are correct. What is the main concern when providing non repudiation? Sender validity. Well, I'd say data origin. Oh, excellent choice. This one had me baffled yesterday, but um, yeah, data origin is the main concern when providing non-repudiation. Um, I'm not sure how data origin and sender identity aren't kind of different ways of looking at the same thing, but you know. You need to ensure message integrity for data transmitted between two of your organization's research offices which of the following cannot be used to provide message integrity? Parity bits, CRCs, TPM, and checksums. So we're looking for the not in, in this mess. What was CRC again? Cyclical redundancy checks. To be TPM, wouldn't it? Yeah, TPM is the wrong. That's the that's the uh, time. Know, the, the, the something trusted protection module. It's an Intel chip and TPM. Yeah, trusted that's a trusted platform module cannot be used to provide message integrity, although it can be used to create uh, full disk encryption. Oh, so there you go.
uh, against which type of attack are timestamps and sequence numbers a good countermeasure? Replay. Yep. That is correct. Which of the following is a prolonged power outage? Blackout. Yeah, this one's easy. And there we go. Which of the following is an asymmetrical algorithm? Idea, two fish, RC6, or RSA? RSA. SA. That is correct. RSA is an asymmetrical algorithm. All other algorithms are symmetrical. Which model types concentrates on preventing the actions that take place at one level from altering the state presented to another level. We have the state machine model, non-interference model, matrix-based, multi-level lattice, information flow, or DNE again. Mm, I think non-interference. Ooh, good answer. Did you know that or were you just taking a stab? No, I think I knew that. Yeah, okay. That that, that dealt with different levels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Non-interference model concentrates on preventing the actions that take place at one level from altering, altering the state presented to another level. Less concerned with the flow of information, more concerned with the subject knowledge of the state of a system at a point in time. Which of the following trusted computer system evaluation criteria rating levels are used in environments that contain highly sensitive information and should be resistant to penetration attempts? So all the different levels or A, C, and D. Highly sensitive information. So it's got to be like, hmm, I would think some B level. Or would be a C level. It would be C level. This is highly sensitive. Well, I'll give you a little bit of a clue. This works just like letter grades. So D, D sucks. Right, and A, very, very good. Oh, okay, then, then yeah, B level then. Yeah, should say B2 and above. Oh, drum roll. Ah, oh, C1. C1 refers to discretionary security protection to enable a rating, okay, so, boo. To enable a rating process, subjects and objects should be separated from the auditing facility by using a clear identification and authentication process. Other listed rating levels have the following characteristics. From whom does the greatest risk of malicious acts come? Insiders, third party, contractors, hackers, partners. Insiders. Insiders. Yeah, those pesky insiders. That is correct. Which of the following occurs when a computer program incorrectly manages memory allocations? Associative memory, implied addressing, absolute addressing, cache, indirect addressing, logical addressing, relative addressing, memory leak, or virtual memory? I think it's memory leak. Memory. Yeah, I think you are correct. Yes, you are. Memory leak occurs when a computer program incorrectly manages memory allocations, which can exhaust available system memory as an application runs. And I've actually seen that happen in action. Um, one place to find out if that's going on is to go into task, task manager. Let's 
so here we are task manager and we can see you know how much memory is being utilized um, but if you get into performance with the charting that's always kind of nice and you know I've I will tell you anytime you're on this chart and one or more of these things are pegged up against 100% you've got something that's something's going on that you don't want to have happening um, a lot of times the, the memory leaks will clear up if you just simply like restart the computer but you know if you continue to use the software eventually you'll have the same the same problem will come back until they provide you with an update that resolves the problem but in any event <clears throat> Which user contacts you regarding a message he is receiving on his Windows computer? When he tries to update a device driver, he receives a message stating that the driver is digitally signed by Microsoft. What should he advise the, dri the user to do? Delete the driver, install the driver, scan the driver for viruses, compute the hash value of the driver file. I don't see a server. Please install ServiceNow ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say install the driver. Yeah. Microsoft is a, is a trusted. Yeah, signed yeah, by Microsoft. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. Um, which common criteria evaluation assurance level describes a system that ignores security threats? thinking it's level one. Should we give it a shot? Yeah. Ooh, there we go. Because you're doing nothing, right? Yeah. More or less. Yeah, EAL1, a user wants his system to operate but ignores security threats. Now, you know, what kind of crazy user is this? Well, actually, you know, if you're doing malware analysis work, <clears throat> sometimes you need to have that security. <laughs> it needs to be out of there. You know, so that the malware can do its thing and you can watch. But this would not be typical. This is, you know, you know, Ed the dinosaur. Oh, I liked it better in the old days. Uh, which of the following trusted computer system evaluation criteria rating levels implies that the security assurance is performed in a formal and detailed manner. Um, a, C, and D, or A1, B1, B2, B3. Anybody? Formal and detailed. I'm totally just guessing A1. No, it's too high. I, I can okay. tell you that. Guess lower. Mm. E2. No. Oh. A1. <laughs> oh, vindicated. Oh, that's just terrible. I can't believe that. Yeah, I just have to. Okay. I thought I'd read up on that last time I was through here, but I guess I was misremembering. Which type of malware uses tracking cookies to collect and report on a user's activity? Virus, spyware, Trojan horse, worm, adware? Spyware sounds good, but adware could be. Yeah. Ad ad <laughs> is, there, is there a difference between adware and spyware? Not much. Let's see if spyware, uh, ooh, like spyware uses tracking cookies to collect and report. Uh, must adware right. is software application that displays advertisements while the application is executing. Okay. Annoying, but not malicious. 
that's where Google tracks what you're doing and then displays yeah. those ads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you have an encryption key that has been placed into an inactive state. Which of the following can you perform with this key? Encryption, decryption, verification, signing, options A and B only, options A and D only, B and C only, B and D only. I don't remember this at all. How about B and C? Yeah, I think in B and C it's got to be it. Because here's the thing. It's an active state. It's in an active state, and the only reason you would use it is to decrypt some information that was encrypted with this key before it was deactivated. And then verification would be sort of like kind of same, same. Let's see how we did. Ooh, good way to go here. Inactive key should be used to perform only decryption and verification. Inactive key should not be used for encryption or signing because of course they're inactive. So there's no way to confirm or decrypt. Which advance in cryptographic history was created by IBM and used a Feistel cipher that Lucifer, Enigma, Kirchhoff, or Venier? And we know that Venier ain't it because that's from like before IBM was a thing. Enigma can't be it because that's the Nazis in Poland. So it's Kirchhoff or Lucifer. I would guess Lucifer, because isn't Kirchhoff's something yeah, that, totally... That was, the, that was back in the 19th century, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Lucifer was created by IBM and used the Feistel cipher. Which of the following is a stream cipher? RC5. No, that's block mode. I think you're on the right, you're on the right track. Two fish and blowfish are both block ciphers. Yep. He, he's, he's moving up to RC4, weren't you, or RC6? And there we have it. RC4 is a stream cipher. Which of the following is a multi-level security model? Bell Lapidula, Brewer Nash, Lipner, Graham Denning. I'm thinking well, it's multi-level. Yeah. Bell Lapidula one. Yeah, let's. Brewer Nash, I think it's a Chinese wall. Yeah. And I have no idea about these guys. The Lipner is a combination of Bell and Biba together. Oh, okay. Probably makes sense. There we go. Bell La Padula model illustrates a multi level security model and allows simultaneous processing of classified information across security levels. So, here we go. What is the purpose of a multi-party recovery key? To ensure that key is not stolen, to ensure the key can be distributed, to ensure that the key is strong enough, to ensure the key can be recovered. Wow. <laughs> Should we take D there and be... Uh, Obvious? No. Yeah. There we have it. Okay. Well, it looks like we've got about five minutes left, and um, I'm going to hop off and get VPN back in the get ready for meetings. Yeah, yeah, and I, uh, you know, we'll uh, talk to you guys next week. We'll be on mod module four next week, or domain four. So, thank you, Bob. Yep. Thanks Bye. for thank uh, you, Bob. Thanks for playing, and uh, we'll talk to you in a week. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.